Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello, I am Saurabh Sharma, Assistant Professor in the School of Arts, Humanities and Social Sciences, Chanakya University, Bengaluru. And we are doing Introduction to Chinese Studies. So today is the 18th lecture, which is titled Rise of China 1989 to 2023, Threat, Opportunity or Myth. So in the evolution of China's foreign policy, we have so far discussed three uh, phases. First was from 1949 to 1960, which was titled Leaning on One Side, when China allied with the Soviet Union in the Cold War. The second phase was from 1960 to 1971. This was a period of Sino-Soviet split. And then the third phase was 1971 to 1989. This was a period of rapprochement, first with the United States in the 70s, leading uh, into the 80s, and then towards the end of the 80s, a rapprochement with the Soviet Union as well. So we have already discussed these three phases in the last lecture. Today's lecture, we are going to discuss the next three phases of China's foreign policy, beginning with 1989 to 2004. So this phase is called height capabilities by time. Uh, this phase was under the leadership of Chiang Zemin, who was the paramount leader during this period. Then the next phase is from 2004 to 2013 uh, called peaceful development or harmonious world. This was under the leadership of Hu Chin Tao. And then the final phase begins from 2013 and it, it continues. But because we are in the year 2023, so we will end our discussion in the current year. So this phase is called Great Power Projection and this is under the leadership of Xi Jinping, okay, the current president of uh, China. Now before we discuss about the rise of China, we must discuss about the fall. Now uh, this situation of fall came in 19. 89, not only in China but also in the Soviet Union, two large communist countries, they faced a certain crisis in this particular year. But the responses were quite different. On the left hand side, you can see the Tiananmen Square massacre that happened in which uh, uh, the protesters were crushed by the People's Liberation Army in the, uh, uh, under the orders of the party leadership. In fact, the general secretary of, of the party at that time, Chao Chiang, was isolated. He was removed from his post and the party elders took the decisions to uh, crush the uh, protest of students and workers and demanding uh, democratic rights. On the other hand, in the Eastern Bloc led by the Soviet Union, when the protest started for uh, democracy, Mikhail Gorbachev, who was the head of the Soviet Union, he did not use military force. So this uh, picture on the right is, is uh, the picture of the fall of the Berlin Wall. So the Soviet Union had built a wall around East Berlin, separating it from West Berlin. In fact, it was a wall around West Berlin. It, it uh, basically uh, cr uh, created an island in West Berlin so that uh, people from East Germany could not go into West Berlin into because West Berlin was governed by uh, a democratic uh, system. Uh, so when on 9th of November 1989, people demanded uh, unification of Berlin by destroying this wall. There was no intervention by Mikhail Gorbachev and he allowed this to happen. So this is the fall of Berlin Wall and this is the beginning 
of the fall of the Soviet communist system. Now why did it happen? Why there were two results of uh, similar kinds of movement? That is because the reforms that China was carrying out were different from the reforms that the Soviet Union did. So the Chinese reforms can be called socialism with Chinese characteristics. And uh, this was basically the idea of Tang Xiaoping, the paramount leader of uh, China in the 1980s, beginning 1978. So socialism with Chinese characteristics meant that although China would embark on a path of economic development using market reforms, using opening up to the world, they will not liberalize politically. So, Tang basically created a boundary that was called four cardinal principles. So, these four cardinal principles were the socialist road, people's democratic dictatorship, leadership of the Communist Party of China and Marxism-Leninism Mao Zedong thought. So, socialist road meant that although China was doing market reforms, that was not the ultimate goal of the Chinese government. The goal was socialism uh, and because this was the primary stage of socialism, some kind of market reforms were necessary, otherwise economic development was not possible. But once economic development had been achieved, then China would return to the socialist path. Okay, this is how the whole uh, experiment was justified. Secondly, people's democratic dictatorship that the Chinese government was a dictatorship and not a democracy. So there was no place for a liberal democracy in China, which they called as a bourgeois democracy. Therefore, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, right to vote, all these had to be under the uh, government's control. So government would decide who will get the right to speak, who will get the, the right to practice religion and so on and so forth. So all these would be regulated by the governments. So that is basically dictatorship, but it is not a dictatorship of one person or an elite class, but dictatorship of the people, people's democratic. The people would democratically determine the dictatorship and how would that be determined? That is the third principle, leadership of the Communist Party of China. So Communist Party of China was a representative of the people, the peasants and the workers and therefore they had the right to rule over China. So they were the dictatorship representing the people's democracy. So that is the third principle. The fourth principle is Marxism, Leninism, Mao Zedong thought. Of course, uh, Tang Xiaoping had uh, deviated from orthodox Maoist thought, but uh, in order to legitimize the existence of the Communist Party, he had to pay a lip service to uh, Mao also because he was the founder of the People's Republic of China, a single party communist state. On the other hand, Mikhail Gorbachev, he introduced perestroika and glasnost in um, Soviet Union. Perestroika meant restructuring of the economy. So the Soviet economic model based on state control was not able to produce enough goods for the consumption of the people. There was a lot of crisis. In fact, they had to import wheat from uh, the United States as they were fighting a cold war with them. So it was not a sustainable model. And so there needed to be some kind of a market reform. There, there needed to be some kind of foreign investment. Soviet Union was very rich in natural resources, but uh, the way they had organized the economy was very, very inefficient. And therefore, to bring efficiency into the system, perestroika was introduced. But unlike Tang, Gorbachev did not set a limit to uh, the reforms. Therefore, he also introduced glasnost because he believed it was possible to restructure the economy only if he got the right ideas. And for right ideas to come, there had to be some kind of openness. So people should have the right to criticize the government. So he allowed that. And he also introduced elections so that uh, better officials are elected to positions so that uh, they can uh, implement the policies properly. Some kind of competition should be there. But because of uh, glasnost or openness, 
certain forces were released which eventually led to the collapse of the Soviet Union itself. So that was the difference between the two experiments, the Chinese experiment and the Soviet experiment. The Soviet Union fell while China continued to rise, although it slowed down uh, for a brief period, a few years, uh, but eventually it began to rise. Now, uh, Tiananmen Square massacre, the movement which started on 15th of April that eventually led to the massacre beginning 4th of June. So that was the method used by the Communist Party led by Tang to suppress the democratic sentiment of the people. And this was also a time when uh, uh, Mikhail Gorbachev, he, he visited China. Now, this was a period when there was a rapprochement going on between China and the Soviet Union. China had, had set uh, three conditions on uh, good relations and Soviet Union had begun to fulfill those conditions. One was withdrawal of forces from Afghanistan, reduction of troops on uh, China-Soviet bo uh, border as well as uh, withdrawing troops from Mongolia plus uh, Vietnam's withdrawal from Cambodia. So all these conditions were being fulfilled. And as a result, the, uh, the relations between the two powers began to improve. And so, Gorbachev became the first leader in uh, 30 years to visit uh, China. The last visit was of Khrushchev in uh, 1959. And because Gorbachev was visiting China, there was also fo foreign media. And therefore, these media people were able to cover the incidents of Tiananmen Square as they uh, emerged. So uh, the idea that uh, the Chinese leadership had was the West was trying to peacefully overthrow the revolution. So this was the counter revolution not using force but peacefully and this was known as the peaceful evolution theory and it was alleged that Chao Chiang the general secretary of the communist party of china was the second gorbachev because gorbachev's policy eventually led to the the collapse of the soviet union and uh, the end of the communist party of soviet union rule so chao chiang's policy would lead to collapse of people's republic of china and end of the communist party of china's rule and uh, so he was called the second gorbachev just like uh, Liu Shaoqi was called the second Khrushchev by Mao because uh, he started the de-Stalinization process and Gorbachev started the de-Leninization process. Okay, this, so this is known as peaceful evolution. So gradually overthrow the communist revolution and establish a liberal democracy. So China did not want that. Of course, as a response, there were international sanctions on China because they use violence and uh, hundreds of people will be killed, perhaps there were thousands, there is no authentic figures that, that, that is accepted universally. It could be from a few hundreds to a few thousands people who died uh, in the suppression of the Tiananmen Square movement. So this was 1989, there is a couple of figures you can see, one is the goddess of democracy which was uh, uh, basically uh, inspiration for the protesters which was destroyed on the 4th of June and then after the suppression the, in the University of Hong Kong, the pillar of shame was erected. Recently when there were protests in Hong Kong, the University of Hong Kong authorities removed this pillar and it is learned that it has been seized by the Hong Kong secret police in the investigations about the revolution. So this pillar no longer exists in the university. So this shows the brutality of the Chinese state. They have a single minded focus on economic development and making China great power and they would not tolerate any dissent or any democratic tendencies in that particular process. Now during this period that is from 89 to 2004, China's foreign policy was led by Jiang Zemin. He held many posts. Ultimately, in 1993, he was the president of China, he was the general secretary of the Communist Party and he was also the chairman of Central Military Commission. So all the power was in his hands. And he started what is known as the Shanghai Click, 
Okay, he he was uh, the party secretary in Shanghai when the Tiananmen Square uh, movement happened, and he handled it very well in Shanghai. In Shanghai, the situation was under control, and therefore, uh, Tang Xiaoping and other party elders were impressed, and and they made him the new leader of China. Now he was assisted by Li Peng, who was the uh, premier of China from uh, 1987 when uh, Chao Chiang became the general secretary. So the post of the premier was vacant and Li Peng was the next premier. And Li Peng was uh, a very uh, orthodox uh, Marxist. Uh, under his leadership, the economic growth slowed down. He did not remain in, in uh, office for long. He, he was, uh, he served two terms and then in 1997, Chu Rongqi, he became the premier. Even before that, uh, since 1992, Chu Rongqi was actually handling the Chinese economy. The entire Chinese economy was under the control of Chu Rongqi. And he played a very important role in further introducing market reform after uh, Tang Xiaoping's famous southern tour. Chu Rongqi was brought into the state council and he introduced a lot of reforms as vice premier and then later on as a premier. And he also led China into the World Trade Organization, which ensured that Chinese economy grew very fast. Finally, the foreign minister of China during this time was Qian Chi Chen. Okay, Qian Chi Chen, he was the foreign minister, he is uh, very famous and very well known all over the world because of his uh, diplomatic skills. He also authored a famous book. I think it, it was titled 10 Episodes of Chinese Diplomacy or something like that. So, uh, under this leadership, China's economy began to grow. As you can see here, from 1990s, Chinese economy grew and when they relinquished their leadership around this time, China had become more than 1.5 trillion US dollar economy. Okay, they had crossed 1.5 trillion dollars. They are still below of Japan, quite less than Japan, but still from uh, the poverty of the Maoist years to reach uh, such heights uh, was unprecedented in, in the world history. And that was because of the policies of that administration. And they basically followed the advice of Tang Xiaoping, who had, who had given a, a kind of a message to the government that they should hide their capabilities and bide their time. China should not try to become a world leader. China should remain very quiet, not criticize other countries, not try to assert its, its uh, power, but focus only on economic growth. So this, this policy is known as Tao Kuang Yang Hui, okay, which is uh, translated differently, it either said to hide one's capabilities and bide one's time or keeping a low profile. But both more or less mean the same thing. Okay, China should remain quiet and wait for the time when it can act. So that is the second part. Yo suo chuo wei. To act when the opportunity arrives. So during this period, China tried to cooperate with the existing powers like United States, Japan, European Union. But from time to time, China had to use confrontation also in order to secure its interests. So a kind of a dual policy was followed. And I have here mentioned some of the some of the examples of cooperation as well as confrontation. So the biggest peaceful step taken by China was after the dissolution of the Soviet Union, China did not go to radical Maoist rhetoric. It continued on the path of reform. And it was asserted by Tang Xiaoping in his southern tour. And as a result, China became a global manufacturing hub, supplying cheap goods to the world in return, uh, earning a lot of foreign exchange and becoming richer and richer. Another example of cooperation was the decolonization of Hong Kong and Macau. I have already discussed this in the last uh, lecture. So, uh, Hong Kong was a British colony, it was returned to China in 1997 and Macau in 1999, Macau was a Portuguese colony and they 
basically were reintegrated with China based on one country, two systems that although they would come under the rule of the People's Republic of China, they would continue to follow a more open system where uh, there will be multi-party democracy, elections, so on and so forth. And the finest achievement of, of cooperation between China and the rest of the world was membership of World Trade Organization and uh, Chu Rongqi played a very important role in this. Okay, China ensured that they met all the conditions set by WTO and China was accepted on 11th of December 2001 and that actually helped China to grow even more. The next decade was a decade of even a better growth path for the Chinese economy. China took steps, confrontational steps from time to time whenever its security was threatened. So one example was the third Taiwan Strait crisis when uh, Li, Li Tanghui, the uh, Taiwanese president, he visited the United States. He was an alumni of the Cornell University. He wanted a visa. The United States government denied him the visa, but the US Congress, the both houses, House of Representatives and Senate voted with an overwhelming majority to give visa to Li Tanghui and the US government could not stop the visa. So, in, in, in the House of Representatives, 396 voted in favor and none voted against, while in the Senate, 97 out of 100 voted in favor and only one voted against. So that was the overwhelming support for Taiwan in the US Congress. Uh, so he visited uh, Cornell University, he addressed uh, the university, uh, he discussed the democratization process in Taiwan. But uh, Chiang Zemin was upset and uh, China launched missiles near uh, the Taiwanese island twice, once uh, in 1995 soon after uh, Li, Tang, uh, Li Tang Hui's uh, visit, second just before the 1996 elections. But actually it was very counterproductive because that gave the opportunity for United States to display its naval might. US aircraft carriers and various vessels, they appeared in the Taiwan Straits showing China who is more powerful and, and it was a threat to China that in case they tried to act uh, non, uh, not peacefully against Taiwan, then US could, US had the power to intervene. Secondly, the 1996 missile launch actually helped Li Tang Wei to win a majority in the elections. Okay, so he, he easily won the 1996 presidential election. So this entire exercise by China was actually counterproductive. There were two more incidents of confrontation during this period. I think we, we won't have enough time to discuss, discuss in details. The first one was 1999 American bombing of the Chinese embassy in Belgrade. America said that it was a this was done by mistake and they apologized for this. And then in 2001, an American uh, EP-3 naval aircraft, it landed in the Hainan Islands and this was a, a, a spy aircraft and it was basically following the Chinese submarine uh, construction happening in Hainan. So China was developing a, a submarine base in the Hainan Island. And so this, this particular aircraft was, was uh, keeping records of what, what China was doing. When it, uh, because, because it, it actually collided with a Chinese aircraft and so it had to land in Hainan and, and the Chinese, uh, the, the American crew was detained by the Chinese, interrogated by them. But eventually after some negotiation, they were all released. Okay, so these were some, some points of conflict between United States and China during this particular period. And then the next generation of leadership came, the, the fourth generation. Chiang Zemin was the uh, third generation leader. The fourth generation leadership was under Hu Jintao. This is Hu Jintao. So he became the leader uh, beginning say 2002 when he became the general secretary. But uh, the chairmanship of the military commission was retained by Chiang Zemin for a couple of more years. But eventually, 
Hu Jintao emerged as the paramount leader. Now he belonged to the Youth League faction. He rose to the uh, position of authority through the Communist Youth League, the youth wing of the Communist Party of China. So they are known as Youth Leaguers. He was uh, supported by Wen Chiapao, who was the premier. So for 10 years, when, when Hu Jintao was the president, Wen Chiapao was the premier of, of uh, China. And then we have Yang Chie Chu, who was the foreign minister. He was a foreign minister from 2007 to uh, 2013. Now, under their leadership, Chinese economy continued to grow. From 1.5 trillion dollar economy, they rose to become a 10 trillion dollar economy and China became the second largest economy in the world. They overtook Japan in 2009 and after that China continued to grow to cross 10 trillion dollars. So their policy was also quite successful. I mean the, the, the fourth generation leadership. Now at that time in 2004, China's rise had become evident. Till that time, you know, there are some people uh, talking about uh, China being a new threat to America or American uh, dominance in the world. But it was not very evident. But after 2004, it started becoming more and more evident that China was fast emerging as a threat because it was essentially a kind of a revisionist power. It was not under any alliance with US. It was uh, forming international organizations as alternatives to uh, US-led organizations, for example, Shanghai Cooperation Organization. And it was working very closely with Russia under Vladimir Putin. So there are certain theories that came up during this time. I have mentioned four of the theories. Maybe I have time to discuss them briefly. The China threat theory basically describes that China as an emerging power would threaten the United States created international order and then it will lead to a war between the two powers. So United States is a declining power, the existing hegemon would be threatened by China which, is, which would be a revisionist power trying to overtake the US. So to stop China, America would have to go to war and so China is a threat and therefore China needs to be contained. So this was one of the popular theories in the West. The other theory was China collapse theory. This was advocated by people who believe that Chinese economy not being a truly market economy because it was under constraints of the socialist road, it could not grow indefinitely. Although China had grown for many decades, but eventually it will it would reach a plateau. Chinese economy would, would become stagnant and then China would collapse because the Chinese state won't be able to provide the economic goods to the people. And as a result, people would revolt and the Chinese state would collapse. The other option would be maybe once Chinese government is not able to satisfy the people, it might launch foreign aggression in order to raise uh, ultra nationalism in the country so that they receive support of the people. So they could invade uh, neighboring countries. But that would also eventually lead to, would lead to intervention by the United States and then the defeat of China. So China would eventually collapse. So that was the China collapse theory. Now in response to these theories, there were a couple of pro-China theories. So one was China opportunity theory, which said that China was not a revisionist power. China was a responsible stakeholder in the international system. So China's rise is an opportunity for other countries. For the West, it was an opportunity to buy cheap goods so that its, its population is able to get uh, all the benefits. And uh, for China also, it was, a, it was an opportunity to, to overcome its poverty. The other theory was China responsibility theory that once China grows, once China becomes rich, then China would become a responsible power. China would won't act like a revisionist power once it, it reaches a certain status because it would like to maintain that status and in order to maintain that status, it won't undermine the system that, that led it to reach that particular status. So these were uh, contending theories in the 
in the international relations field. Now, in terms of practical foreign policy concepts that China uh, designed during th this time, I have mentioned some of them here, you can see, new security concept. Now, this was in the aftermath of the Iraq war and George W. Bush's um, unilateralism. So, China argued that China does not follow such an approach. China criticizes unilateralism. They believed the new security co uh, concept that uh, the, the threats at that time were not between nations. The, these were non-traditional security threats like terrorism, you know, drug car cartels and, 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 and so on and so forth or, or say pirates and so on. So, these are non-traditional security threats and so countries should work together in, in, in a multilateral format in order to counter these non-traditional security threats. And China does not believe it has any security uh, conflict with any, any nation. In fact, China wants to work with other nations in order to ensure global peace, stability and security. Then China also advocated multilateralism. China had been a late comer into uh, the multilateral platforms because Mao, Mao's revolutionary rhetoric, Mao believed that China is a great revolutionary power and it should lead revolution all over the world and therefore cooperation with other countries was very difficult. But gradually China began to join international organizations beginning with the United Nations and I already mentioned WTO. It also started uh, participating in the di dialogue with the ASEAN countries, Southeast Asian countries. And it formed its own uh, regional organizations like the Shanghai Cooperation Organization and later on BRICS uh, in 2009. So, China was advocating multilateralism at that time. Then the third uh, concept is good neighborliness. So, this comes from the 2001 Treaty of Friendship between Russia and China. So, there was an unsettled border between the two countries. They went uh, to almost, almost went to a war in 1969. After the rapprochement with the Soviet Union in 1991, a treaty was signed, but the Soviet Union soon collapsed and therefore, uh, the status of the treaty was uncertain. And therefore, when Vladimir Putin became the president of Russia, China signed another treaty, this time finalizing the boundary between the two powers. So, in that particular treaty, the, the word good neighborliness is used. So, China proposed that it could, it could sign similar good neighborliness treaties with other countries after some give and take like with India, Bhutan, with which China had not yet signed uh, boundary agreements. Then uh, in 2003, Chang Pichian, Chang Uh, a, a Chinese foreign policy thinker, he in the POA forum, he gave a speech in which he argued that China's rise was, would be a peaceful rise. It will not be a rise like say Nazi Germany or Imperial Japan. It would be a peaceful rise. China does not have any violent intentions. It does not want to overthrow anything. It wants to rise peacefully. So, that was the speech he gave and so this concept of peaceful rise became very popular. But uh, you know this comparison with, with Nazi Germany and uh, Imperial Japan did not go away and uh, especially this character, people uh, have talked about this, uh, that this character of uh, uh, Chinese character indicating rise is similar to the Chinese character for earthquake. So, earthquake means destroying the, the system. and so. Chinese government was not very comfortable with the concept of rise. So, they replaced this rise with the word development, peaceful development. Tu Chi was replaced by Fa Chan, peaceful development. Then uh, Hu Jintao as, as the leader of China, he wanted to make his own contribution to uh, foreign policy uh, thought, I mean doctrinal contribution. So, he gave a speech in the United Nations in which he talked about the concept of harmonious world. This comes from the Confucian concept of her, harmony. So, China wants harmony domestically in form of harmonious society 
and also internationally in form of harmonious world. So China won't act unilaterally but work through United Nations and other international agencies. It won't go into war with other countries but cooperate with them uh, through mutual benefit, give and take and so on. So this was a big idea promoted by Hu Jin Tao. And this is the same time when the concept of soft power became popular in Chinese discourse. We are going to have a whole lecture on soft power. Our final lecture would be on soft power. So I won't uh, discuss this in this particular lecture. Let's go ahead. So the fourth generation of the leadership was then replaced by the fifth generation leadership in 12, 20, 13. So the fifth generation of Chinese leadership is led by Xi Jinping. Now Xi is a princeling. Okay, so, so there are three factions in, used to be three factions in Chinese politics. The Shanghai clique of, of uh, Chiang Zemin, which, which was very powerful till uh, Xi Jinping came to power. Then uh, the, the Tuan Pai of uh, Hu Jintao, uh, the basically the youth leaguers. Okay, like Li Keqiang. Li Keqiang was the premier of China for 10 years. So he belonged to the youth league faction. He was a protege of Hu Jin Tao. Now Xi Jinping was a princeling. Uh, princeling me meant that his father was one of the important leaders of Chinese Communist Party who had uh, participated in the long march with, with Mao and helped Mao to establish the People's Republic. So he was one of the great leaders of China. Unfortunately, some of these leaders were persecuted by Mao. In fact, most of them were persecuted by Mao in the Cultural Revolution. So, Xi Jinping's father was also persecuted. In fact, Xi Jinping himself had to suffer during the Cultural Revolution. So, uh, somehow Xi Jinping was able to emerge as the paramount leader with the support of Hu Jintao, who removed uh, the rival of uh, Xi Jinping, Po Xi Lai, uh, who was another princeling. But I think uh, we have already discussed this in the previous lecture, so I won't go into details. The thing is that Xi Jinping, after coming to power, has concentrated everything in his hands. So, Tang Xiao had introduced collective leadership. So, Xi Jinping has entered, uh, he has pushed China into a phase where he is the undisputed leader. There is no collective leadership, he is the absolute leader. Of course, there are some checks and balances. As we saw recently with uh, Qin Kang, Qin Kang was a protege of uh, Xi Jinping. He was uh, selected as the foreign minister of China. But last month, he suddenly disappeared and uh, then he had to, he was removed from the post of foreign minister. And Wang Yi, who was the foreign minister since 2013, has again become the foreign minister. So he has returned to being the foreign minister. Uh, now, Qing Kang was, was a protege of Xi Jinping, but he was perhaps involved in some, as reported by the media, he was involved in some scandal with a media personality, a lady, and uh, a child was born or something like that. We are not uh, right now sure about what exactly happened, because the uh, Chinese system is very opaque and the information does not uh, always filter out. Okay, so even uh, a protege of Xi Jinping he can be removed in case uh, there is some, some threat to the leadership of the Communist Party. But he has been able to concentrate more and more power in his own hands. Uh, last year there was this uh, uh, clip, video clip of Hu Jintao being uh, removed from the meeting of the National Party Congress because he was uh, you know, questioning some of the decisions made by the uh, party leadership. His, his, his own protégé had not been included in the list. I have already discussed these in the, uh, when, I, when I was discussing the Chinese political system. And finally, we have Li Qiang, who is the current premier of China. Under the new leadership, Chinese economy has continued to grow from being a 10 trillion dollar economy to being more than 15 trillion dollar economy. Some people, of course, they contest the statistics. And after COVID, Chinese economy has definitely slowed down. And some people are even talking about a collapse of, of Chinese economy. But uh, 
the poly polity is very stable. Xi Jinping has, is in full control of the government. Now, Xi Jinping institutionalized some of the foreign policy institutions in, in, in uh, China. So, he, he gave it a kind of a concrete form once he became the leader. So, Chinese foreign policy decision making is led by the Foreign Affairs Commission of the Central Committee of the Chinese Communist Party. So this particular organization which is led by Xi Jinping himself actually decides on the foreign policy of China. Number two is the premier in this particular uh, commission and, and then number three is the vice president. So different people have occupied the post and then there is the director. So the director of the foreign affairs commission is the senior most diplomat of China. So just like say the foreign secretary, but here the foreign secretary would be senior to the foreign minister. Okay, so, so it is a unique post. So Yang Chie Che was the first director of the foreign affairs commission. The current director is Wang Yi. Under the foreign affairs commission, then there is the ministry of foreign affairs of the state council of the people's republic of China, that is the foreign ministry. So, foreign minister is the head of the foreign ministry. So, Wang, Wang Yi again, Wang Yi is the head of the foreign ministry. And then under the foreign ministry, there are departments led by director general. I think there are about 20 odd departments, each led by a director general. So, this is the foreign policy decision making structure. The commission makes policy, then the ministry implements the policy with the help of the departments. Now, Xi Jinping reversed some of the policies introduced by uh, Tang Xiaoping. For example, he, he abandoned the, the keeping the low profile policy and introduced great power diplomacy, Ta Kuo Wai Chiao, great power diplomacy. That China had now emerged as a great power and so China should act as one, it should try to protect its interests, it should try to form alternative platforms because it cannot be a follower any longer. It, it has to be a leader. And so he, he inaugurated his whole idea uh, initially when he came to power through the concept of Chinese dream, just like there was an American dream that America was a promised land for the people, people could go to America, land of opportunities and rise and, and America uh, was a hope for the world and so on and so forth. Similarly. There was a Chinese dream that China was also an example to the world and the Chinese people also could do achieve anything in life in, in, in whatever fields they had passion for. So that was this concept of Chinese dream. He wanted to create a, a kind of a new America in China so that people from around the world, especially Chinese people from Chinese ethnicity could come to China and then achieve their passions inside China. Uh, one important uh, component of, of, of this whole uh, Xi Jinping thought was the Belt and Road Initiative. Now in the next lecture, I am going to discuss that in more details. But this is basically a revival of the ancient Silk Road that China had which went through different parts of Asia all, all the way into Europe plus the, the maritime road that is uh, Cheng He, the famous Chinese admiral, he, his voyages. Uh, into the Indian Ocean, going into Africa and uh, Asian countries, other Asian countries. So, this is a revival of that same route. So, two ancient routes to be revived by through Chinese investments into the infrastructure. So, what, what was the raison d'etre of, of all these things I am going to discuss in the, in the next lecture. Then the, another interesting concept that came up during this time was the wolf warrior diplomacy. Now, Wolf Warrior is a movie franchise in, in China where the hero uh, Lung Feng, he, he is, is uh, uh, an action hero, he is a, he's a officer in the People's Liberation Army and he goes and, and fights with villains and saves uh, uh, people and, and uh, you know performs uh, extraordinary action sequences and so on. So, it, it became very popular in China. So, some Chinese diplomats have adopted this particular style of diplomacy. So, uh, it means uh, 
a gung ho approach, uh, an approach where China does not take things lying down. China is ready to face questions by journalists and reply them in kind. Okay, in case China is criticized, they will criticize the uh, the person from which he comes, the, the journalist, the country from which the journalist comes. Means aggressive approach to diplomacy. Before that, China generally followed a kind of a uh, a poker face type of a diplomatic approach. The Chinese uh, spokespersons won't uh, really express themselves, and they would just read out written statements. This this type of diplomacy often has been counterproductive, and uh, and counterproductive for the careers of people engaging in this, because uh, often it has been seen that they 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 have not been able to rise beyond a certain position because uh, as foreign ministers or or in other leadership positions for example director general china would prefer uh, people that are liked by other countries but this is also a product of great power diplomacy the confidence that a uh, 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 new breed of chinese diplomats have now let me discuss some of the foreign policy goals of china there are certain uh, geopolitical uh, areas which are very important for China. One is the South China Sea. So this is the map of the South China Sea. This entire area is the South China Sea. This is the East China Sea here. Now within uh, South China Sea, there are some territorial disputes between China and other countries. In fact, even before the formation of the People's Republic of China, the Republic of China has issued a map which these days is known as nine dash line. Okay, these are nine dash lines, these lines here. These are nine lines. It used to be 11 dash lines, but uh, uh, Cho and Lai had, had got some of these dash removes because of some diplomatic issues. But currently, these are the territorial claims, maritime territorial claims of the People's Republic of China. And this includes the Paracel Islands and the Spartli Islands in the South China Sea. And this brings China into dispute with countries like Philippines, Malaysia, Brunei, Indonesia and Vietnam and also of course Taiwan which is Republic of China because Taiwan claims many of these islands. So China has formed certain um, you know, uh, is building certain artificial islands in, 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 in the South China Sea. Uh, but Vietnam and Philippines also had been building their own, uh, you know, trying to solid, solidify their own claims by being active in the South China Sea, by, by occupying islands and so on. So there is a competition between China on the one hand and other powers on the other. In fact, Philippines took uh, China to the permanent court of arbitration at the Hague because of this, uh, the, this artificial island that China was building and China refused to participate in the arbitration but uh, the, the court ordered that uh, both sides should stop building uh, these uh, artificial islands especially China because it was uh, progressing faster. Although it, it refused to give judgment on, on, on the sovereignty issue. Okay, any, anyway, it was an arbitration and, and so if China does not accept it, it, it can't be implemented. But, but the whole procedure was under the United Nations law of the sea, which, of which China is a signatory. Okay, still China refused to participate in this particular arbitration. It believes that this is basically a way of, uh, of America to interfere in South China Sea through Philippines. This was in, in, in basically in 2016. Then of course, Taiwan is a big issue, Taiwan, uh, China, China claims to be a part of China and it is accepted by most countries of the world. Right now the status quo is Taiwan has a democratically elected government, a uh, developed economy and it does not want to actually join China under one, one country, two systems because of what is happening in Hong Kong. Uh, because once it integrates with China and the central government's interference starts, it could gradually undermine the democratic institutions in Taiwan. So this is another important geopolitical issue for China. Then there is another one, this is, uh, you can't, it is not visible here, 
the Senkaku Islands or what China calls as Tiaowu Islands. Now this is under Japan. Japan controls these islands, but China claims these islands to be there. These are basically rocks. No one lives there, small rocks. But it, these are important. All these territorial issues are important because there is a lot of oil and gas underneath the sea. And uh, sovereignty issue will determine the exclusive economic zone and the maritime boundary of country. So the country which, which, which uh, occupies these islands or has sovereignty over these islands, it would have about 200 nautical miles of exclusive economic zone around the, these islands. And therefore, in order to exploit the energy resources, the, the, the sovereignty issue becomes important. Therefore, Senkaku Islands are important in this sense. So this is basically a Chinese interest in the South China Sea. Then in the Indian Ocean, China has its own Malacca dilemma. So these are the Malacca Straits here between um, Indonesia and Malaysia. This is a sea lane that connects the South China Sea with the Indian Ocean. But Indian sovereign territory of Andaman and Nicobar Islands is near the Malacca Straits. So in case there is a war between India and China, Indian Navy could blockade the Malacca Straits and stop the Chinese energy supplies. So in order to break this Malacca dilemma, China is developing what is known as the string of pearls. It is developing certain naval uh, bases around uh, the in, in uh, South China Sea as well as in the Indian Ocean so that it has the capacity to to undo the blockade made by the Indian Navy. If Chinese Navy is stronger in the Indian Ocean, then the, it could counter the Indian Navy. Again, uh, I will discuss this in details in the next lecture. Moving on, then the, all these then are ultimately tied to the Belt and Road Initiative, which basically integrates the whole uh, Chinese approach, uh, whether it is String of Pearls or it, it is uh, the South China Sea or Chinese connectivity uh, to, with uh, Eurasia. So all these are tied together in the Belt and Road Initiative or say in the Chinese language it will be one belt, one road. Again this is also part of the, the upcoming lecture. So I would like to conclude by uh, summarizing the uh, rise of China. So rise of China is primarily an economic rise. So from 1978 onwards, China started reform and opening up that led to increase in its GDP almost 10 percent per annum continuously for means of course it's an, in an average some years it was less but uh, some years it was uh, some years it was even uh, even 14 percent. So in an average about for four decades China grew at 10 percent and that basically turned China from being a poor country which was in terms of per capita income even smaller than India to becoming the second largest economy in the world. And they have used this new economic wealth in, uh, to build its own military. So in terms of military power, China is now in the world, far behind the United States because United States is advanced than China. In fact, all the Western countries are far advanced than China. countries are smaller uh, than China, much, much smaller. United States in terms of size with China. But technologically, it is several advanced than China. And, and China has been denied Western technology, especially after 89, China has been den completely denied Western As a result, China had be has become dependent on Russia. From the Ukraine war is no longer a match for the Soviet Union, it was a match, but it is no longer so. West has a lot. Uh, it's also building its indigenous technology because it has no other helpful in the sense of building up the quantity of military equipment which is maybe not as good but it has 
them in large numbers because it is built by China by itself and it does not have to buy expensive western gear for its military. So there are positives and negatives both to, to this. But anyhow, China is now the second largest uh, military power. In terms of comprehensive power, if you take together military power as well as uh, economic power or maybe or some soft power also, comprehensive power, China is even better. It is quite close to United States because if you, if you, if you take into account its population, its economy, its soft power, if, if you take all that together, then you can say China is quite close to the US as you can see from these figures by Lowy Institute. Of, of course, these figures are all indications. These are not uh, uh, perfect uh, representations of, of, of reality. These are just estimates made by expert in order to compare different countries. Other countries are far behind as you see India, Russia, Japan in terms of both military power as well as comprehensive power are far below United States and also quite below China. So this is how China's rise is and, and uh, the option for the neighboring countries of, of, of China to counter this China rise has been to rely on United States to defend itself or in, in order to build its defense capacity. For example, with India joining the Quad, the quadrilateral security dialogue with United States, Australia and Japan. Similarly, there is AUKUS. Australia, United Kingdom and United States, all these countries working together in order to contain the rise of China. So I would say China's rise is real and it is a threat because of the behavior of the Chinese state. Being an authoritarian state, it wants to assert its power in the world. It wants to revise the international order and therefore I would say it's, it's, it's an opportunity in, 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 to a certain extent but it is more of a threat and it is not a myth although some of the figures could be fudged but overall we can see that China has actually risen. So I will stop here, we will we'll discuss uh, other things in the next lecture. Thank you. Hello, welcome to the 20 hour course on introduction to Chinese studies. I am Saurabh Sharma, assistant professor in the School of Arts, Humanities and Social Sciences, Chanakya University, Bengaluru. Before this, I was assistant professor of political science in the Rajiv Gandhi National University of Law, Punjab. I have studied Chinese studies from the center for East Asian Studies, School of International Studies, Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi. I basically teach political science and international relations to undergraduate students. So this course offers you some basic ideas on China that I have learned over the years from teachers of Chinese studies as well as from my own experience interacting with Chinese scholars as well as visiting China. In this particular course, there, there are 20 lectures. You can see this is the list of the lectures that we have. Let me briefly go through this list. First lecture would be on the origins of Chinese civilization in which I talk about where the Chinese civilization began, how it began and what are the main ideas that constituted Chinese civilization. The second lecture is on a very, impo on a very important concept in Chinese political thought known as mandate of heaven. So this thought came about in the Zhou dynasty period and it that is about uh, 1000 BCE and since then each coming dynasty has used this concept in order to justify their own rule. 
थैंक यू